All right, let's bring in Rupert Reed, who's an associate professor of philosophy over at the University of East Anglia. He's also the author of Why Climate Breakdown Matters. He joins us now from Norfolk in the UK. Rupert, great to have you on the show. Um, I suppose you don't really need to read between the lines to, to, to figure out that, um, that the climate crisis is not only increasing the odds, uh, but also the severity of these droughts, which is leading to this massive loss of, uh, of water expressed in gigatons. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's awful. It's terrifying. What can one say? Water is life. Uh, without water, what are we? And this really ought to concentrate our minds, along with the many other things that we've seen happening in recent years. The implications are many. We need to think about how we reduce water waste, how we adapt to the kinds of conditions that we're inheriting here. So, for example, it means that agricultural practices need to change. There's an awful lot of water that is used and wasted in agriculture. If we move to drip feed irrigation, for example, we can save a lot of water that otherwise we use up. But obviously at the root of this is the man-made dangerous climate change that is driving fundamentally this uh, drying up of lakes. That's the, the bottom line. That's the biggest factor here. And so it's yet another reason why the world needs to really pay attention to this and understand that, as I said, water is life. Um, picking up on that theme, if, if water is life, and, and you can easily understand why it's essential for people uh, when it comes to sort of, uh, I mean, to put it mild, uh, crudely, uh, crunching their thirst, I mean, uh, drinking water. Mm. You also mentioned it, it being critically important for, for agriculture and that, that there needs to be a shift to, uh, to more efficient, watering systems, maybe drip watering. Um, how does the, uh, the, the um, lowering of water levels in, in, in water basins like lakes uh, really affect the agricultural um, situation in and around these areas? Obviously, it can be extremely bad. It, it means for poor people, things like longer trips to, to get the water that they need that they often have to carry home. It means that obviously less water is available for agricultural uses and other uses. And we need to be very clear here. That this is only the beginning. We are at, still in the early stages of dangerous anthropogenic climate change. And unless we respond better to these very clear warning signs, then this kind of problem is going to accelerate. Think, for example, of those lakes and river systems that are fed by regional snowfall on uh, mountains. Uh, at the moment, in some, of those, some such parts of the world, as in parts of uh, Eurasia, uh, obvious example is the, is the Himalayas, what's actually happening is we're getting accelerated rates of the melting of that ice and snow, which is actually giving us a false sense of security as to how much water we still have. So mm -hmm. picture what will happen when that snow and ice is no longer available to seasonally melt and replenish our lakes and rivers. It, the kind of problems that we've seen so far will come to seem pale in comparison. This, this underscores the grave urgency of the crisis. I, I, I totally uh, understand what you're saying. Uh, Bob, who we had on before you, right before you, said that we uh, urgently need to cut uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, you're saying that this is just the beginning. I'm wondering, if you have any confidence uh, in us, if this is reversible? What a great question. And my answer comes in two halves, really. If the question is, do I have confidence in our leaders to undertake that leadership for us and start to make those cuts? The answer, I'm afraid, is no. We are not getting leadership from hardly anywhere in the world on this right now. For example, the G7 is meeting right now and most of the countries in the G7, very powerful, rich countries, are completely off the pace on this. But then there's another part of the question, or another aspect, which is, do I have confidence in us, the people, to potentially do something different about it? And there, I think there is more grounds for optimism, because people are waking up to this. They are starting to realize, with these ever-increasing warning signs, that something has to be done, and that our leaders right now are not up to the job. So I think that we, the people, have the capacity from the bottom up to move on this, 
And we've seen, we've seen the first signs of that around the world in recent years, for example, Greta Thunberg and the school climate strikers. But what is needed now is many more people from across the world, ordinary people from all walks of life, parents, mm -hmm. teachers, workers, professionals, people who live in communities together, to realize our governments don't have this. They haven't got it. They're not on top of it. We need to start to act on it for ourselves, and we need to up the pressure on them to get serious on it. That's the only way that we can do the right okay. thing by our children and by the future. Rupert, I appreciate talking to you. Thank you very much for joining us here on the News Hour.